How many of you ever wondered where that came from? I think we've had it in a reading before, but now you know, right? It's right there in Psalm 19. Um, There's a lot going on this morning in our Bible passages. Um, The Old Testament reading said that they got the the scrolls out and, and all of them were there. All. As that was read this morning, that's all I heard. All. 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 The Old Testament or the New Testament reading where Paul talks to the Corinthians about how we're all a part of the body and each one of us is a member. And the, the members that don't have you know, the prestige or whatever are clothed with greater honor and those that don't need to be clothed with greater honor aren't. And that all parts of the body are important. And it's true. If you don't know, Gray's Anatomy has over 13,000 parts, I believe, listed for the human body. 13,000 listed parts. There's a lot of things in that that make this up and make this work together. And you can live without some things. But some of the things that they've said that you can live without, they're now saying actually served and still might serve a purpose. And then we have our reading from Luke. Where Jesus... Filled by the Holy Spirit. This is a lesson right after one that we're going to see here in a couple weeks because we'll start Lent in two weeks, right? Next week is the Transfiguration and the following week is the beginning of Lent. And then the first Sunday in Lent, we get Jesus being driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted and tested by the devil. And that's what happened right before here. So Jesus, filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, as he turns to Galilee and starts to teach in their, in their synagogues with them, Right? So my question this morning from the Gospel of Luke is two words. I want to know what they mean or what our definition of them are. The first one is spiritual. Have you ever had somebody tell you that I'm spiritual but I'm not religious? What does that mean? And I'm not trying to be mean or say something that's hurtful this morning. I'm just asking questions and wondering. My second one, my second word for this morning is power. Who has power? Who who are people that have power? Who? The military? Do all of the people in the military have power? No, not all the people. Who has the power? The boss. Who's the boss? Carrie has the power. (laughs) See, she's not in here. I can say that. (laughs) The president. Who else has power? Parents. To their children, yes. Who else has power? God. Teachers. Jesus. But why does Jesus have power? Our reading says it this morning. They returned to Galilee because, and he was filled with the power of the Spirit. Jesus only can do what he did because the God and the Holy Spirit has filled him and given him power to go and do what he did. I saw an excellent joke yesterday. I've been looking a lot on the internet for jokes over the past few days. I've needed to laugh. So I've been looking for jokes. And I found one yesterday that talked about how, and it fits right in here with the power, Jesus filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you, do you know what kind of car Jesus drove? He drove a Honda. Why? Because, why? Do you know why, Helen? Because he didn't speak of his own accord. He spoke because the Holy Spirit had filled him and given him the power to do the things that he did. So who has power? We've named all these people that have power. And Jesus talks about who he came to give power to here in our, in our reading this morning. He says, because I've been anointed to bring good news to the president and to the generals. And to, to give extra money to those who already have it. And to give everything to those that, that don't need it. Right? That's not what he said. He said, I've come to bring the good news to the poor. 
to release the captives, to give sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. Are these people that have power? These are the people that we walk by on the sidewalks and don't want to look at. These aren't the people we think of when we think of power. That's exactly who Jesus came to. That's exactly why Jesus came. He came to give to the poor, to release the captives, to give those who couldn't see sight, to set anyone who's held in any kind of bondage free. And who is that? There's two ways to look at this, actually. Actually, there's probably more than two, but there's at least two ways to to look at this passage of Scripture. Who's poor? Or who in here thinks that they're poor? You've got to watch what you do there, because remember, the pastor might say something. I'll raise my hand. And the question there is, does that mean poor financially? Or poor in spirit? Or some other way? Right? Because that's how we could read this. Poor meaning, I don't have the resources or the finances to do the things that I need to. And while it's true that, that many of us in here struggle financially... On the whole global scheme of things, you're rich. Right? It's people who have been to other parts of the country, other parts of the world know that while we don't have all the things that we need, we are sitting very pretty compared to the rest of the world. So while we may not be poor financially, we still could be poor in spirit. And he came to release the captives. How many of our how many of us are held captive by something? I need I remind you you're in church. <laughs> right? We're all held captive by something because we're both simultaneously saint and sinner. We are both redeemed and filled with the the flesh of this world. Every one of us has something that holds us captive. So are we talking about those who are in bondage someplace else, being oppressed for their, their beliefs? Or are we talking about us spiritually here and now? And he says he's going to give sight to the blind. Are we actually talking about those who physically can't see? Or are we talking about those of us who can't see things because of the sinfulness that's holding us captive? Or And then he goes on to, to say that he's going to set the oppressed free. Who's oppressed? How many of you have ever been oppressed? Again, there you go. What's the pastor going to say to that one, right? In the whole grand scheme of things, have we ever really been oppressed and held down for what we believe or for any reason? You know, there are, there are 51 countries in the world where if I walked out into public wearing this symbol, I could be arrested and executed. That's not 20 years ago, people. That's today. This symbol. I could be arrested and executed. That's oppression. I can't get my TV because DirecTV is having a problem. That's not oppression. (laughs) Right? It's all in the grand scheme of things. So what is this passage talking about? Is it talking about the reality of everything being physical? Or is it talking about spiritual? Because I want to tell you something. I believe that if you say you're spiritual and not religious, you don't understand what the Holy Spirit has come to do. Because it says here in our passage that Jesus was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And where did he go? He went to be with the people. And he talked to them about what God had sent him to, sent him to do. He didn't go off on his own someplace. And I'm not knocking those who go off on their own for their spiritual journey. Because I've done that before. And it's a wonderful thing. To be off on your own. In solitude with God on the mountaintop, it's a beautiful thing. But God tells us we can't stay there. We have to go out. And when He fills us with the Holy Spirit, He sends us out to go and do what He's called us to do. And that's to bring power to the people that don't have it. Because you know what this says? Scarily enough, it says that God sees you. And he sees all of you. Those pieces and parts that you don't want anybody to see, you don't want anybody to know about. Right? I'm not going to ask you to name them. We've all got them. I've, I've got things I don't want anybody to know about. Do you know what? You can't hide that from God. 
God sees every last bit of who you are. All of the beautifulness that he created and all of the ugliness that comes in because of the sinful natures that we follow. But do you know what? God still loves you. In spite of that ugliness. In spite of the things we do that draw us away from him, God still loves us because Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captive, to give sight to the blind and set the oppressed free. So nothing we can do can keep us away from God because the message of the gospel is something for us each and every day and something that he commissions each and every one of us to go and to take, to fulfill and to show the world what he's called us to do. I have a quote here from Edward Marquardt. From the Witnesses for Christ. It's a workbook. It's a student book. And the quote is, God's story is always related to human need. For example, if a woman is dying of cancer, the gospel is God's strong word of resurrection. If a person is permeated with guilt, the gospel is God's assurance of forgiveness. If people experience extreme suffering, the gospel is the prayer. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our time of trouble. For the starving, the gospel may be bread. For the homeless refuge, the gospel may be freedom in a new homeland. For others, the gospel may be freedom from political tyranny. The gospel is always related to human need. It is never truth and is in a vacuum, a theologically true statement which may or may not relate to one's life. The gospel is God's truth, God's message, God's action, God's word to a particular person, to a particular need, to a particular historical situation. You don't throw a drowning person a sandwich, however good the sandwich may be, it just doesn't meet the person's need. You throw the drowning person a life jacket or a lifeline or you dive in to rescue them. So it is with the gospel. The gospel is God's truth, God's action aimed at a particular human need. End quote. I just loved that part. You don't throw a drowning person a sandwich. It might be the best sandwich you've ever had in your life, but it's not going to do anything for them. That's what the gospel is about. The gospel speaks to us where we're at. It enlivens us and fills us with His power. It's God's influx of the Holy Spirit coming to us and telling us who God is and who we are for the world. So just as Jesus was anointed, each and every one of you was anointed. At this font, maybe not this one, but one like this, you made promises or your parents or your sponsors made promises for you. And all of you who are lifelong Lutherans, And confirmed members of the church made an affirmation of your baptism. Do you remember that? Do you remember what happened at the affirmation of your baptism? You restated the promises that whoever it was stood at that font and made for you. You promised that you would live with God's holy people. That you would come to the reading of the word and to the holy supper. That you would be a beacon of God's hope for the world. The actual promises are found on page 237 if you want to come up in your book. But you have made public profession of your faith. You intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism. To live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and to share the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus Christ and to strive for justice and peace in all the world. That's you. You. God made those promises through you that you are going to be here. That you are going to participate in the Lord's Supper. That you're going to be a part of His body. That you're going to share God's love with all of the world. God's anointed you to do that. And filled you with the Holy Spirit. Church is not us gathering here. Church is us going out there into the world and showing them what God has called us to do. And that, my friends, is power. And that, my friends, is being spiritual. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Moved in the power of Christ to go into the world to show forth His love to everyone. And that's what God has called each and every one of us to do. So go. Not yet. We still have a little bit of service. Go. Out those doors. And serve Christ. Through everything that you do. Showing forth His love. To a world that so desperately needs to see.